jealousy. You know, most often when we think of jealousy, we think of something bad. You know, it's, it's a husband so jealous over his wife that he loses his mind and he's irrational. Or Saul with King David, you know, he became so jealous of David that he, he, he went mad, totally mad. But today we're going to be talking about a different kind of jealousy. We're going to be talking about the jealousy that your heavenly father has for you. And, and you know, he loves you. He loves all of his children. May not love what we're doing, but he does love us. And, and I think that's a key to jealousy. Because if you didn't love someone, even if it's the bad kind of jealousy, you wouldn't be jealous over them, would you? If something happened, you'd just go, ha, I don't care. But to, to, to be jealous, you have to love someone. And, and your father does love you. And all he wants in return is for us to return that love, to do the very best we can to follow his instructions and his commandments, which we all fall short. We, we, but that's why we have repentance, thank goodness, the beauty of Christianity. But when we allow ourselves to fall away from him, or we place anyone or anything, including ourselves, above him, that provokes him to jealousy. And can you expect blessings when you're provoking the Lord to jealousy? <laughs> Forget it. You're not going to get any blessings from him when he's, you know, jealousy, when, when you provoke the Lord to jealousy, he's angry. And don't expect any blessings when he's angry. But the, the thing that really makes his day is, and I know because his letter tells us so, is when one of us that has fallen away comes back to him. And that's what really makes his day. We're going to pick it up today in the book of Exodus chapter 34. You can open your Bibles there. But God is preparing his children, the children of Israel, to go into the promised land. And he knows that the people of the promised land, the Canaanites for the most part, have God's small g, multiple God's small g. And he's preparing his children and he's saying, look, I know they're there, but when you go into the land, I want you to destroy them. I don't want to worry about you being drawn away from me, the Lord speaking, and serving their gods, small g. So with that, let's pick it up. Let's ask that word of wisdom as we always do. Chapter 34, book of Exodus, verse 1, and it reads, And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee, or cut, two tables of stone like unto the first. You know what happened to the, the first set? when Moses was coming down from Sinai and he saw Aaron and everyone else with golden calves, he threw them down and he broke them. And I will, the God speaking, write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest. Verse 2. And be ready in the morning and come up in the morning unto Mount Sinai. Sinai in Hebrew means bush of Yah, because that's how he appeared. He manifested himself in that burning bush to Moses. And present thyself there to me in the top of the mount. And no man shall come up with thee, neither let any man be seen throughout all the mount. Neither let the flocks nor herds feed before that mount. Not one. He's angry at this point in time. Four. And he hewed two tables, Moses did, of stone like unto the first. And Moses rose up early in the morning and went up unto Mount Sinai. This would be his seventh and last ascent. As the Lord had commanded him, took in his hand the two tables of stone. Of course, the Lord's going to write the Ten Commandments upon these two tables of stone. Tablets, you could think of them. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord as promised in Deuteronomy 33, 19. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Long-suffering means patient. The Lord is called long-suffering or patient in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 where it states that he's long-suffering or patient 
And he's not willing that any of us should die, but that we would all come to repentance. He is patient with us. Keeping mercy or grace for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And that will by no means clear the guilty. You're going to get what you pay, what, what you deserve all at one time. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children under the third and to the fourth generation. Now some people read that verse and they, there it is right there. It says in the Bible that there are generational curses that the children are going to pay for the sins of the parents. Make a note if you believe that of Exodus chapter 20 where we have the Ten Commandments. And God said that same thing there in about verse 4 or 5. He said, yeah, for the third, fourth generation of those who hate me. But then in verse 5 or 6, he qualifies that, but showing love and mercy to those who love me. What that means is that if the children continue in the sins, the idolatry, if you will, for an example, of their fathers, they're going to get the same punishment that their parents do. But if they change their way and go back to him, they don't receive that punishment. They receive his love and his mercy. And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. And he said, if now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us. Let, let him abide with us. Let him walk among us. For it is a stiff-necked people, it's a stubborn people. And pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for thine inheritance. Verse 10. And he said, Behold, I make a covenant before all thy people. I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. And all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord. For it is a terrible or an awesome thing that I will do with thee. Verse 11, observe. This word in the Hebrew is shamar. It means to guard. That thou which I command thee this day. Behold, I drive out before thee the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite, all of these tribes of the Canaanite peoples, of course. Twelve, take heed, again, the second time. This is the same Hebrew word as observe in verse 11. Shamar, guard, twice for emphasis. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, whither thou goest, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. Don't become trapped into worshiping their gods, small g. But ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. This word groves is the first occurrence of 40 in God's word. And it, in the Hebrew tongue, of course, is Asherah, the phallic worship. Verse 14, the reason we came here. For thou shalt worship no other god. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. That's Jealous with a capital J, you'll notice. The Lord saying himself, my name is Jealous. And of course that word Jealous is from the Hebrew prime Kana, and it means zealous, if you will, or, or very eager. He, he's, he, he doesn't want to lose his children to worshiping false gods. And, and, and I know a lot of people go, well, that was in the Old Testament. That was a long time ago that they were worshiping those false gods. What about today, beloved? People have gotten so far away from worshiping the living God that what should be the highest Christian holiday, they're out rolling Easter eggs. Rather than teaching God's word, they're all wrapped up in the traditions of men. They're going to... They're not going through a tribulation, according to them. They're going to fly away and be gone. And it's a shame. And our Father, and you say, well, this is in the Old Testament. It's just as bad or worse today, beloved. There's nothing new under the sun, God tells us. He doesn't want his children worshiping anyone or anything other than him. Turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 4 with me. 
We're going to spend a little time in the law this morning. It's good for us. The schoolmaster that brings us into Christ. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Moses again uh, preparing the people to go into the promised land. Deuteronomy 4.14. And the Lord commanded me, and this is Moses speaking, at that time to teach you statutes and judgments that you might do them in the land, whether you go over to possess it. And you know, there's a big difference between learning God's statutes and judgments and doing them. And that's what we all need to focus on is not just learning his word, but as it's written in what in James chapter 1, verse 22, be ye hearers and doers of the word. Verse 15, take ye therefore good heed. How many times are we going to hear that today? Shema, be, be careful, take guard unto yourselves. For ye saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spake unto you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire. God didn't manifest himself to you in a way that you could recognize anything. So don't you be making molten images that you think look like him. You don't know what he looks like, so you can't make a rock or a stick that looks like him. That's probably the reason he did it. And then where would we get? Good, verse 16. Lest ye corrupt yourselves... And make ye a graven image, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of a male or a female. And that a direct reference to the groves, again, the Asherah, the, the male uh, phallic symbol. 17. The likeness of any beast that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged fowl that flieth in the air. The Egyptians were good about uh, worshiping goats or this beast or that beast. He said, don't be like the Egyptians. I brought you out of Egypt, out of bondage. Worship me, not the, the same gods that the Egyptians. What good did the gods of the Egyptians do them when I delivered you out of Egypt? God saying, the likeness of anything that creepeth on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the waters beneath the, the earth. And Dagon may come to mind, the fish god of the Philistines, you remember? when the Philistines stole the Ark of God from Eli and his sons, what did they do? They took it into Dagon's house, and Dagon fell over the first night. The second night, they set him back up. He fell over this time and broke off all of his limbs. So, God in control. Verse 19. And lest thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. He gave us those as signs and seasons not to worship. But uh, man, oh boy, boy, how many tribes of people over the centuries have had a sun god, you know. Verse 20. But the Lord hath taken you and brought you forth out of the iron furnace even out of Egypt, to be unto him a people of inheritance as ye are this day. He brought you out of uh, terrible oppression in the land of Egypt. Pharaoh had a, quite a building appetite, and a lot of the Hebrews spent most of their day trampling down straw into mud up to their knees, making bricks for Pharaoh. And if it weren't for Aaron and Moses being sent by God to Pharaoh saying, let my people go, they'd still be making bricks for Pharaoh, no doubt. 21. Furthermore, the Lord was angry with me for your sakes and swear that I, this is Moses speaking, should not go over Jordan and that I should not go in unto the good land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. And Moses uh, slipped up pretty bad, actually. Uh, this was written in Numbers chapter 20, for those of you that aren't familiar with it. And what happened there was the Lord, the people were out of water. I mean, here they are, 2.1 million people, 600, 
and 3,000 fighting men, which I roughly estimate with their wives and children would be about 2.1 million people total, are out here in the desert. They're out of water. The Lord instructs Moses, go speak to the rock. And what did Moses do? He went and he struck the rock twice and said, hear us, you rebels. Must we bring water out of this rock? I think Moses would have had a hard time bringing any water out of that rock without God on his side. But anyway, and, and I see in that a type for you, his elect. Because when the Holy Spirit speaks through you, what are you to speak? Speak what the Holy Spirit says. Don't take on some other thing on your own of striking the rock twice or some mumbo jumbo or rubbing your belly or doing this or that. Do what God said. Speak. And for that, Moses and Aaron, it cost them the promised land. <laughs> the rest of them didn't do much better either. They're going to end up wandering around in the wilderness for 40 years. 22. Moses continues, But I must die in this land. I must not go over Jordan, but ye shall go over and possess that good land. And again, that older generation, they didn't go into the promised land. Joshua and Caleb, the only two that God saw fit to allow them to, and they had to live an extraordinary number of years above normal so that they could enter the promised land. The rest of them, uh, they, they, they tempted God ten times over the manna, over the, we got to have meat, we need quail to eat, over the golden calves, over and over and over. They tempted God. Numbers chapter 14, those ten temptations. And God said, I've had it. That's it. Stand back, Moses. I'm going to destroy this people. And I'll start over with you and make you a stronger nation than them. And Moses, being the intercessor he was, said, Lord, now the Egyptians are going to see this happen. And they're going to think that you weren't strong enough to bring this people out of Egypt and into the promised land. And God said, well, okay, I'm going to let them live. I'm not going to strike them dead right now. But none of them are entering the promised land. Only those that were 20 years or younger. Where did we get to? 23. Take heed unto yourselves, lest ye forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you. Once again, take heed and make you a graven image or the likeness of anything which the Lord thy God hath forbidden thee. Today, we can throw in there, don't worship the Antichrist when he appears. 24, for the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. He's a consuming fire from the first time Moses saw him as that burning bush. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29, our God is a consuming fire. He is a jealous God. He, he gets upset when his children start worshiping anything other than him. 25. When thou shalt beget children, and children's children, and ye shall have remained long in the land, and shall corrupt yourselves, and make a graven image, or the likeness of anything, to worship, in other words, and shall do evil in the sight of the Lord thy God, to provoke him to anger. Seems like when we uh, get fat and happy, that oftentimes we fall away from the Lord. When times are hard and tough, we start looking around going, boy, something's not right here, you know. I better get back right with God. And then things will go. Just your run might come to mind, fat, dumb, and happy, and forget the Lord. They move away from Him, start worshiping other things. 26. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that ye shall soon utterly perish from off the land, whereunto ye go over Jordan to possess it. Ye shall not prolong your days upon it, but shall utterly be destroyed. In other words, if you take on other gods. And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations. Boy, did he do that, as those ten tribes went over the Caucasus Mountains. And ye shall be left few in number among the heathen, whither the Lord shall lead you. And there ye shall serve God, small g, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see, nor hear, nor eat, nor smell. 
Has that ever made sense to you? That somebody could put something that can't see, that can't hear, that can't talk as their God? I mean, how intelligent does that sound? It just For, for some reason, I, I can't get a hold of that. But, boy, it sure happened over the centuries. Verse 29. But if, we have a condition here, from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him, if thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. The last words, or some of the last words, advice from David to his son Solomon. First Chronicles chapter 28, verse 9, he said, If you seek the Lord, you'll find him. If you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. But understand what this is saying. This is saying, even after the dispersion, and you've set up false gods in front of you, even after that has happened, he's still a loving and merciful God. If you'll turn back to him, he'll forgive you. When thou art in tribulation, oh, ears perk up here. Have we got a tribulation coming up in the future? You bet. And all these things that are come upon thee, even in the latter days, whoop, ears perk up a little bit, latter days, when is that? We're in it, folks. This is the, the generation of the fig tree. If thou turn to the Lord thy God and shalt be obedient unto his voice, to his word, to hear his word intelligently and do it. 31, for the Lord thy God is a merciful God. He will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers which he swear unto them. Just like the prodigal son in the New Testament. He forsook his father, basically, and said, give me my part of the wealth of the family. I'm going to go have a good time. And he did. He took off and he blew his money and things really got bad then. And he was eating the husks that were left over after they fed the hogs. And he thought, wait a minute. My servants at my father's home eat better than this. And that's just the way God is. That's what the whole prodigal son is. It's a, a, an example that we can look at and say, that's the way our heavenly father is. When you turn back to him, he wants you to come home. Turn on over with me, Deuteronomy. I got to share with you, I was preparing this message yesterday. I was missing something. I, I knew it. It just wasn't clicking, you know. And I prayed, which is, you know, something that you should do when you, when you don't know which way to go with it. And I thought, I need one more scripture here that, that really grasped the whole idea of jealousy. And he, he led me to Deuteronomy 32, which is the most important scripture that we could ever be familiar with. Why? You know, when we go to Revelation chapter 15, verse 3, we end to learn that the overcomers are going to be singing this song, Deuteronomy chapter 32. So it's one that we should all be very familiar with. And, and why it didn't come until I asked, I, I can't explain it to you, but, but he gave it to me and here we go. Let's, we talked about, you know, when things are good, sometimes we think, look what I did with my two hands. I am so intelligent, I am so productive, I am so good. Look what I did. And then when we fall away from God, it happens almost every time when things are going good. We look away and start seeking other things than Him. But then when things get bad, we're real quick to go, Oh, Lord, you know, help me. And, and that's, that's what we're going to see here is things are really good for Israel at this time. Deuteronomy chapter 32 Verse 15. But Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked, or despised. Thou art waxen fat, thou art grown thick, thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God which made him and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. You know, the rock of his salvation, of course, is Jesus Christ. And all this uh, is, is to grow thick means to be dense, in other words. Verse 16. They provoked him to jealousy. Here we go. With strange gods, with abominations, provoked they him to anger. 
His name is Jealous, Exodus 34, 14, you recall. And you know what? Those that are in bed spiritually with Antichrist when he returns, they've rejected the rock of his salvation in a way because why? They're, they're already worshiping this false god, the false Christ. 17. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to God, small g, whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Why didn't your fathers fear them or revere them? Because they're new. They didn't exist at the time. Verse 18. Of the rock, capital R, that begat thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. Forget God, he will forget you. Common today. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them, because the provoking of his sons and of his daughters, their conduct of apostasy, uh, brings about judgment and punishment. And he said, I will hide my face from them. This is the Lord speaking. I will see what their end shall be, for they are very forward generations, stubborn children, in whom is no faith. 21. They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. This word means their nothingness. And I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. You provoke God. What does he say? I will provoke you to jealousy. And what is this, this, you know, think about this. What does this verse mean? God's saying, if you had done things my way, you would receive my blessings. You would be a peculiar people, he promised. A, a treasure, if you will, unto me. If you'll do things my way. But he's saying, I'm going to take those blessings that were right here for you, and I'm going to give them to someone else. Because you provoked me to jealousy. And you're going to become jealous because you're going to see these other people receiving the blessings that you could have been receiving yourself had you just done things my way. I think too here this last verse is referring to Amos chapter 6 verse 14 where we have Hamath, Rechab, that should bring to mind Kenites and uh, he caused them to, to come into power there, if you will. And God said, you know, I'm not going to cleanse the land again until some point in the future, and that will happen. Ezekiel prophesied of someone that is really good at provoking God to anger. In fact, is he's called the image of jealousy. Turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 8. Ezekiel chapter 8. Verse 1. And it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I sat in mine house, Ezekiel speaking, of course, and the elders of Judah sat before me, that the hand of the Lord God fell there upon me. Now this is the second vision that Ezekiel is experiencing. Verse 2. Then I beheld, and lo, a likeness as the appearance of fire, from the appearance of his loins even downward fire, and from his loins even upward as the appearance of brightness as the color of amber. You may remember in chapter 1, verse 4, that color amber in the Hebrew, highly polished bronze. We're talking about the presence of God here. Verse 3. And he put forth the form of an hand and took me by the lock of mine head. Picked me up by my hair. And the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven. 
and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looketh toward the north. We're talking about the tabernacle here. Where was the seat of the image of jealousy which provoketh to jealousy. Now, let me ask you, who wants to be on the north side? Antichrist. He wants to take God's place. This image of jealousy is a type for the Antichrist. And, and Ezekiel has been taken in the spirit to the time in the future when Ezekiel, excuse me, when Antichrist is set up in the tabernacle pretending that he is God. You talk about provoking God to jealousy. Verse 4, And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there according to the vision that I saw in the plain. Verse 5. Then said he, this is the Lord speaking to Ezekiel and to me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now the way toward the north. So I lifted up mine eyes the way toward the north, and behold, northward at the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. Type for Satan himself. He said furthermore unto me, Son of man, seest thou what they do? Even the great abominations in his house, in his tabernacle, that the house of Israel committeth here, and I should go far off from my sanctuary. I'm going to leave my sanctuary and leave them on their own, is what God's saying. But turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. Ezekiel, you haven't seen anything yet. Look what these people are doing. And he brought me to the door of the court. And when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Holes are a place where we often hide things. Then said he unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, behold, a door. There was a hidden door there. And this is all, of course, pointing to the fact that the abominations that are going on in the churches today are being pointed out to not only Ezekiel, but to us as well. And he said unto me, Go in, and behold the wicked abominations that they do there. They've got their Easter eggs that they're rolling in the groves. They've got their rapture theory that they're going to teach their people to fly to save their own souls. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things and abominable beasts, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. Anything that gets between you and your relationship with your heavenly Father is an idol. And there stood before them seventy men of the ancients, the elders, they should have known better, of the house of Israel. And in the midst of them stood Jeazaniah, the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. Here we have false prophets, and their incense going up at this point in time is nothing but lies. Uh, they're prophesying, but they're not prophesying out of the mouth of God. They're prophesying out of their own heart. Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? every man in the chambers of his imagery. For they say, The Lord seeth us not. The Lord hath forsaken the earth. You know, they even doubt that God is real. They, they don't think God is, even cares what's going on on earth. God doesn't know what we're doing. He, he doesn't see what we're doing in the dark. He said also unto me, Turn thee yet again. Look again, Ezekiel. And thou shalt see greater abominations that they do, ever worse and worse, he's saying. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Tammuz, uh, much like Ishtar, uh, as far as a goddess of fertility. <coughs> Excuse me, the Phoenicians worshipped her as a god of, of animal and vegetable life. Verse 15, Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these, getting worse and worse. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, 
And behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east. They're having a sunrise service. And they worshiped the sun toward the east. Then he, this is Yahweh, said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with the violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put the branch to their nose. They're snuffing up the Asherah. <clears throat> Verse 18. Therefore will I also deal in fury. Mine eye shall not spare. Neither will I have pity. And though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. Let them cry unto their sun gods. Let them cry to Tammuz. Let them cry to Antichrist. You know, Paul spent <clears throat> the majority of his life, <clears throat> excuse me, after he was struck down on the road to Damascus teaching God's truth. And he did that because he was jealous for us. In conclusion, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul was also jealous for us. And you know what? That indicates that he loved us as well. Chapter 11, verse 1, 2 Corinthians. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly or in my foolishness, and indeed bear with me. But there's something very serious he has to say. Verse 2. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, you're betrothed, if you will, to one husband, that of course is Christ, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. That's how jealous Paul is over you. He, he wants to present you not as someone who's in bed with Antichrist, but as a chaste virgin. Those are the only ones that are going to be fit to be the bride of Christ. Verse 3. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Always keep it simple. The simplicity of Christ's teaching. If something seems more difficult than, than, than what it is, go to the Father. Ask Him to clarify. Ask Him to show you. Reveal what this means to me. Because he keeps it pretty simple when you think about it. Of course, this word beguiled, I'll bet if I asked and we had a test in here to see how many of you know what the Hebrew word for beguiled is, I'll bet 95% of you would say it's expatio, which means what? It means wholly seduced. Just as Satan and his role as the serpent in the Garden of Eden wholly seduced Eve, that's how Paul felt about us. I don't want you to be seduced by the Antichrist. I'm jealous over you. I want to present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Verse 4. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, or a golden calf, or an Antichrist, whom we have not preached, or if we receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Ye might swallow it hook, line, and sinker. For I suppose I was not a wit behind the very chiefest apostles. I wasn't inferior to any of them. But though, or if, I be rude or unlearned in speech, yet not in knowledge, but we have been throughly made manifest among you in all things. Paul studied under Gamaliel, one of the greatest teachers, doctors of the law at the time. And he might not have been uh, college learned, college educated, but he was certainly knowledgeable of the word of God. Verse 7, 
have I committed an offense in abasing myself that ye might be exalted because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely. And Paul always edifying uh, those and bringing others up to his level. Verse 8. I robbed other churches taking wages or rations of them to do you, the, the church of Corinth, service. You know, I didn't take anything from you. I didn't want you to think I was in it for the money. Verse 9. And when I was present with you and wanted or had need, I was chargeable to no man. I wasn't a burden to anyone. For that which was lacking to me, the brethren, which came from Macedonia or Greece, supplied. And in all things I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. Verse 10, as the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia, rejoicing and glorying in the word of God. No one's going to keep me silent. Verse 11, wherefore, question, because I love you not, God knoweth. There we have it. Paul loved you. That's the reason that we have the New Testament, the biggest part of it. But what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherewith they glory they may be found even as we. Verse 13, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. This word disguising is, is what transforming means. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Satan himself is disguised as an angel of light. He's disguised as Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, many are going to worship him. And that is going to provoke our Heavenly Father to jealousy. You know, at this time, anyone that's off in the ways of the world, it's not too late at this time for them to turn to God. But I fear there is a time that it comes too late. And, and that time is like those, the virgins of, of Matthew chapter 25, when Christ, you know, comes back and they all go into town to buy more oil. And when they come back, they knock on the door, Lord, Lord, open, let us in. He's going to say, get out of my sight. I don't know you. I never knew you. And uh, fortunately, we have the millennium. Uh, there will be teaching of discipline at that time. Uh, I don't think that uh, anybody will be provoking uh, our father to jealousy during the millennium. I hope not. Let's go to his throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your written word, Father. Uh, we appreciate your word. We ask you to continue to open our eyes, open our ears to your truths, Father. Reveal your truth. You have here a group of people who want to accomplish your will, Father. Reveal that will to us, Father, and we will serve you. In Yeshua Jesus' precious name, amen, and thank you, Father. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. The Word of God, and that is how you understand the Word of God uh, also, it has 198 appendices at the back of the Bible, which are spe a, a special studies on a variety of subjects, all intended to add meaning to your studies. Excellent uh, work by Bullinger. Edward in Arkansas, where in the Bible does it say to study chapter by chapter and verse by verse? You'll find that in Isaiah 
chapter 28, verse 10, uh, line upon line, precept upon precept. Sean from California, what does it mean to not count it robbery to think of yourself equal to God? Is not that kind of what Satan did? Well, if you're reading from Philippians chapter 2, verse 6, John, and that's not addressed to you and I. It's not saying that we should consider ourselves equal with God. Keep up with your subject. Again, you have to rightly divide the word. And if you'll back up to verses 5 in Philippians chapter 2, you learn that it's talking about Jesus Christ said it's not counting it, not, not to think yourself equal, not counting it robbery to think yourself equal to God. Why? Because he was Emmanuel, which means God with us. So Christ, how can Christ say he was equal to God? Because Christ is the same as God. Again, this is Mike, no, this is Michael in Wisconsin. Will you please explain Matthew chapter 24, verse 9? It states then that then they shall deliver you up and shall kill you. And if one of God's elect uh, were delivered up and they should refuse or blaspheme the Holy Spirit to speak through them, that is the unforgivable sin. Uh, that would bring about their spiritual death. I don't think it'll happen. Rebecca, and I don't know what state Rebecca's from, she does. The woman that was caught in the act of adultery, why did they think they could judge her? The Lord said, who has no sin, let him cast the first stone. Why did they think they could bring judgment upon her? Well, Rebecca, they were trying to uh, pull a fast one on Christ. And they were basically saying, you know, the law of Moses says that this woman should be stoned. Uh, you know, what do you say? And that's when Jesus said, uh, he, he bent over and he started writing in the dust. And he said, you know, uh, Paul, where were you last Tuesday night? And about that time, Paul got up and departed. And, after, and remember that the question that I always have had about this scripture is they say they caught her in the very act of adultery and brought her before Christ. Now, wait a minute. If they caught her in the act, where's the man that was involved in this adulterous act? They let him go. So that's just par for the course, typical man. Uh, we hold others or we try to hold others uh, to a higher accountability than what we hold ourselves. And, and that's exactly what Jesus pointed out to them as he bent over and wrote <clears throat> in the dirt. And one by one, the, the guys that were accusing the woman departed. And uh, when Christ rose up, he said, Woman, where are thy accusers? And she said, I know not. And he said, Neither do I go forth and sin no more. That means that Jesus forgave her of her sin. Don't forget Jesus forgive sin, and if you're like me, you're very appreciative of that fact because none of us deserves it. Jimmy in Louisiana, <clears throat> why does the Bible say, call no man your father? And uh, I think that we can kind of go back to that question where we would place ourselves on an equal to God. Don't place anybody on an equal level with our Heavenly Father, and that's what that scripture means. It doesn't mean that we in the English language can't call our paternal parent Father. <clears throat> Quite all right. Just don't put him on an equal level with your Heavenly Father. Luke in Tennessee, in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, it says, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel translating to God with us. But how can God and Jesus be the same when in the millennium Jesus will be here? But God the Father won't arrive until after the millennium. Are they the same as in the same spirit, but two different sets of bodies? Or is God the Father not in an angelic body, but instead a consuming fire, as stated in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29? And 
I like to think of, of Jesus and the Holy Spirit and Yahweh being the same entity in different roles. You know, Satan has different roles. He was the serpent in the Garden of Eden. Uh, he's called the dragon. Uh, he's called uh, uh, Lucifer, different roles that he had. And just as Satan has different roles, God has different roles as well. But uh, Emmanuel, like you said, if you translate it, means God with us. That's what it means. Uh, if you want New Testament, go to John chapter 1, verse 1, where it states that in the beginning was the Word. That word, Word, in the Greek language is logos, which is Christ. In other words, in the beginning was Christ, and there was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's why Jesus, when he told the disciples, uh, they said, you know, well, let us see God. And Jesus said to them, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And that's exactly what Jesus meant when he said that. They're one entity, and wherever the Jesus or Father or the Holy Spirit is there also. Carrie in Minnesota. My husband and I attend a church that teaches the rapture doctrine. I no longer attend. And I have been studying with the chapel and my husband says this is not the same as attending church. We have grandchildren that still attend with him and they are now starting to not want to attend seeing that I no longer am going. What should I do until I can locate a ch local church that teaches God's word chapter by chapter, verse by verse? I do not want the children to stray away from the Word of God. My grandchildren, parents, my grandchildren, parents do not attend a church at this time. <clears throat> and Carrie, you know, I can't tell you where you should go to church. Uh, that's something that you have to decide on your own. Uh, you know, in keeping children involved in church, I understand what you're saying. It's important for them. Uh, to develop the, the learning that they obtain in Sunday school, for example. But, you know, the only thing I can recommend, and it may be that God has a purpose for you to be at that church in leading someone to the truth about the rapture. But, uh, again, I can't tell you where you should go to church, uh, pray about it, and take God's lead. As far as whether you're being in church when you study with the chapel, uh, Jesus said, you know, wherever two or three of you are gathered in my name, I'm there in the midst of you as well. So you're in church when you're studying with the chapel. We, we are gathered together <clears throat> in Jesus' name. April in Illinois, <clears throat> excuse me, loved ones who have passed, do your loved ones who have passed still see into this earth age? And I think probably not uh, continuously. It may be, uh, I have known of instances where when someone loses a relative that God allows the spirit of the deceased to come back and let the person know that they're all right. And, but I think that's for a very short period of time and it's strictly to comfort the one who is left here on earth in the flesh. But I don't think that uh, they're in a different dimension. We can't see into that dimension, and I don't believe that, that God probably allows them to see into this dimension unless he has a purpose in doing so. It'll be interesting to learn when we get there. Uh, Paula from Tennessee. Uh, dear Pastor and Dennis, uh, I want to thank you for your teaching. You're welcome. Let's get to the question. My question is about Halloween. A lady I know said she doesn't put out pumpkins because they are evil. Halloween is evil. We put out decorations and give out candy to children. I think Halloween is what you make of it. To me, every day is an evil day. There are evil people out there. Is Halloween <clears throat> a pagan holiday? I don't want God to be upset with me since we decorate on Halloween. I ask God to forgive me if I am doing wrong. We don't worship it. I don't think you're doing a thing wrong. Uh, I, I, I agree with you. Holidays are what we make them. 
and you want to teach children the truth. Halloween is not a religious holiday. And it, in fact, originally it was called all hollow even is where the actual term came from. But I, I have a strong suspicion that if we tell our children that, you know, we don't, if they see other kids going out and getting awesome amounts of candy, and then we tell our kids, no, you see, we don't do that because of our religion. What do you think our kids are doing? I think we're turning them off to religion. The same with Christmas. If we say, and they see all these other kids getting all these presents at Christmas, and then you say, no, we're not going to do anything as far like that because that's against our religion. And I think you're driving your kids away from religion. So I don't think there's anything wrong with allowing your children to participate in the events just make sure that they understand it's not part of our religious heritage and keep the two separate. Norma and, and you know these costumes and everything it doesn't have to be something evil uh, you know you could uh, uh, dress your little one up as John the Baptist or or Hannah the mother of Samuel or whatever so it doesn't have to be something evil and I see I'm out of time so I'm going to save that next question till tomorrow I do want you to know that I love you a great deal because you enjoy studying our father's word in depth and you know what our heavenly father loves you because he when he looks down and he sees you with the letter he wrote to you the Bible it makes his day when you make his day believe me he's going to make yours we are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you. We want you to do that and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. Most important, beloved, is this. You stay in his word every day. Every day in his word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? Because Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.